Look, when I've answered this before, and I'll repeat it again, that look, when we look at hadith in the past, how can we believe Islam is for all times? Do we agree? that let's, let's take this step by step, briefly. Step one, do we believe that Islam is for all times? Yes, we do. Tick. Do we believe that we can access the information about Islam in all times? Access it meaningfully. We can access it. Tick. Now here there's a problem. The hadith that we have today, how do we know these hadith are true? This is a question. Yeah, this is a question. Now some people will answer this by saying, oh, that's easy. We will look at the chains. Hmm, okay, point. The problem here, is, so when you say this, okay, go to the next checkpoint. The problem here is that, okay, we look at the chain. How we verify the chain through the books of Rijal that say, that do like CRB checks on these people. This narrator, weak. This narrator, reliable. This narrator, problematic or okay. Problem number one is this a ton of opinions on each narrator. Somebody saying it's okay, somebody saying it's utterly unacceptable. Okay, so, you know, Imam Nasai is saying uh, Awais, uh, Ismail ibn Abi Awais is unacceptable, Bukhari is saying it's okay. So this, you've got problems, okay, so different, like an utter clash, a yes and a no from different people on most narrators. Problem number one. Problem number two is even if, let's just take the fact somebody says, oh, he was okay. He's, he had a good memory. The question is, the bigger question is, how do we know that that was true? Because these people that are saying it didn't actually ever meet him. So even if Imam Bukhari said, let's say Imam Bukhari said that uh, Urwa had an amazing memory. Let's just take that as a point. But Imam Bukhari never ever met Urwa. And he wouldn't have known anybody that directly knew Urwa. So him vouching for him, hmm, how, how is that equally meaningful for us today? So how? Because let's just be transparent. Because remember, most of these people didn't ever meet the people they were speaking about. The most of the people they're speaking about, the majority, they never ever met them in their lifetimes, ever. Like they, they had long died before them. So the question is, well, how did they know they were truthful? Well, you'll say, well, I'm sure their teachers would have told them and their teachers got it from their teachers who got it from somebody who would have known him. Possibly. I agree, that's the theory, but we don't know because we don't have those names. We don't, they haven't told us that. That is our guesswork. So, okay, so let's agree on that. So the truth is that we have people saying things about people who they never even ever knew personally. And they couldn't have met them because they died generations before they were even born. So, but we take it in some good faith. But the problem is, now we're going to make judgments based on this. So good faith, hmm, you know, we need to take it with a pinch of salt because it's just good faith at the end of the day. So we fall back on the three principles that the scholars of Hadith taught us and the scholars of Islam, that whenever a riwayah comes to us, a Hadith, it must not clash with reason. لا يبين المعقول Right. Lam yubayin al maqul. Lam yukhalif al manqul. It cannot go against the Quran and it cannot uproot. Lam yunaqid al usul. It cannot uproot an Islamic principle. Once these three are fine, then okay. Now we can take from these people, if that if they've said that, and we can even take from people we, who we wouldn't primarily take from. So by the first and general preference, we will take from people who have been deemed okay now. So they've passed that check. People said they were okay, but they have to pass these things. Once they pass all of this, fine. Then we will take from them. Okay, so that's the criteria. 
So when I'm saying that, look, the age of Aisha, why is this problematic? Because it seems to go against, right? It, it, seem, it goes against reason. It clashes that the prophet would have, uh, that if he's a prophet of God, why? how could a prophet of God be doing something like that? Be even looking at a girl like that, like for marriage, who is just a kid. That goes against reason that... Either he's not a prophet of God then, or if he's a prophet of God, then he wouldn't be doing things like that. So it goes against reason. It seems to go against the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an seems to suggest that the women marrying, it refers to them as women. Right? That marry the women. Don't stop the women from marrying. You don't refer to little kids. And when the Qur'an is referring, even in those ayat that people say are talking about Aisha, that they say that, uh, and Allah says, Ya Nisa and Nabi, that the women of the Prophet, what is a 10 year old woman? And now they're going to try and reverse engineer that, but people don't refer to little kids as women. Right? So the Quran seems to be going against that understanding. The Quran seems to address children as separately. It doesn't, it doesn't, the Quran doesn't even, uh, <coughs> the Quran doesn't even obligate them with salah at that age. So a girl that doesn't even have to pray can be making judgments about marriage. And you'll say, well, no, she doesn't have to make the judgment. Oh, so it's forced upon her. And the Quran says, la ikraha fid deen. There is no compulsion. So it goes again and then it uproots Islamic principles, people. It uproots the principle that marriage needs consent. The consent, rid of tarafain. And how can a six-year-old consent? And you can say, well, yeah, she can understand. Well, okay, can she consent to a transaction? Can a six-year-old be, be purchasing land? No, not in according to Islamic uh, law, not even according to regular common law. Six-year-old can't go and purchase land, can't purchase a property, can't purchase a car, can't purchase things because she's just a child. Oh, so she can't comprehend that, but she can comprehend marriage. So either she's capable, and if you say she's capable, then why can't she be, why, uh, why can't she pray? She ought to be sinful for not praying then. So Allah hasn't even mandated salah for her. Till, according to the Islamic principle, until the age of 10, to some discernment. And that's just for prayer. That's just like doing rituals. That's not even a complicated thing. So, yet, so when you look at the, the principles of like commerce, a child cannot conduct commerce on its own, a child cannot go to war. A child cannot delegate things to other people. A child in Islam cannot even manage its own finances. Like, be in like let's say there was a certain amount of wealth left for a child. Uh, let's say like uh, a child was orphaned at the age of 10 or 9. A 9-year-old, let's take a 9-year-old, and there was wealth left. That is not handed over to the child. A guardian watches over until they become baligh. Until they become pubescent. And then you test them so long as they don't have any mental defect. And then you hand it over to them. That's in the Quran. And that's an Islamic principle. So it goes against this. So it's going against the Quran. It's going against the uh, reason. It's going against the Islamic principles. And the great narrative that why the Prophet married anyway. Because of the year of sorrow. So yes, then... We see that these narrators have been problematic as well. And I've highlighted that. And we show that this doesn't make any sense. And Urwa, we know that Urwa was the nephew of Aisha. And certain people did try to hurl allegations at Aisha at a later age, saying that she had committed adultery and things like this. And before she married the Prophet. And it makes sense that maybe Urwa fabricated or misrepresented uh, or misrelayed as in the, when it came to that narration he maybe pushed back her age to show that oh but she married the prophet as a child because he was really fond of Aisha who was his aunt 
and when there were a lot of allegations uh, by people, obviously Muslims generally don't believe that, but there were some people at the time who were trying to say, oh, Aisha had committed adultery before she married the Prophet and so on. And this is why she knew that uh, Safwan, when, uh, you know, the whole hadith, or if, uh, the, when there was the allegation that she had an affair with him. But they were saying later on, although Allah exonerates her in the Quran, they were saying, well, how did he know her? from before so some people made up stories later on in the generations after the prophet that oh she must have had an affair with him before she met the prophet now so Urwa most likely if anything may have pushed back her age to kind of to make her seem like oh what are you talking about she was so young when she married the prophet how could have she had an affair that's one interpretation i'm not saying that is what happened but that's plausible but the point is that th this content is baseless. So yes, if we find a narration by Urwa or Ibn Juraj or uh, let's say Zuhri, which complements these three things. So let's say you find a narration by uh, Ibn Juraj or Urwa saying there are five salahs in one day. Is that a problem? No, it's not a problem. Let's say you find a narration by these or other people saying that alcohol is haram in Islam. Is that a problem? Because they've been criticized? No, it's not a problem because it complements these three. If you find a narration saying something like, oh, you know, there's a virtue in reading the Quran and so fine, you can act by it. But if you find something that throws the whole character of the Prophet under the bus and they've been criticized, then na na na. This, uh, this one, not nice, my friend. So here we stop that and that's where we stamp things down. So I hope that makes sense. So these people who say, oh, but Mufti has criticized Urwa here, but uh, sorry, used a narration from him here, but he's criticized him here. Yes, I'm not saying that everything, just because I do feel that these people have said certain things and they have maybe at times misinformed. But it doesn't mean everything they did in their life was misinforming. It doesn't mean that. I mean, that would be absurd to assume. Even the most, even if you take the Kadhab from the books of Kadhabin, those who are utter liars in narration, I'm sure not everything they said in their life was a lie. You know, if you get a, a Kadhab Rawi, I don't know, Khalid al Madaini or other people, or pure Kadhabin, and then they say, Oh, here's a hadith that La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah doesn't mean that's a lie. Just because they're a lie doesn't mean that they have to lie in everything or misinform in everything. So use your common sense for God's sake. Right? So I hope that's some sense to Gangu Teli Saab. 